morning and welcome to our November 3rd, 2018 Saturday Bible Study. We're broadcasting from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, and Betty from California is our moderator. Okay, I'll start off with the, uh, the Bible was my textbook. It answered my questions as to how I was healed, but the scriptures had a had to me a new meaning, a new tongue. Their spiritual signification appeared, and I apprehended for the first time in their spiritual meaning Jesus' teaching and demonstration, and the principle and rule of spiritual science and metaphysical healing, in a word, Christian science. From Retrospection and Introspection by Mary Baker Eddy, page 25. Does anyone have anything to add to that? (laughs) (laughs) We're on radio silence. (laughs) (laughs) It's very beautiful. And to have her explain, this is Eddie, how she apprehended and had this, uh, felt the spiritual meaning, understood it for the first time. It's uh, where we could all do it. I find that since I started Christian Science, that the Bible has come alive for me also with uh, different interpretation through Christian Science. It makes sense now. I read it before, barely read it before, to skip through maybe at Christmas time or something, you know. But now it, delving deeper into it, it, it with the interpretation of Mrs. Eddy, it seems to really make sense for me, and, and I really enjoy the story. Mrs. Eddy described a very important process for all of us one thing to open the books and read the words, but to get past what's right in front of your eyes and grasp the spirit is uh, the essence of the whole thing. And that's quite a precious thing. And the fact that she stated this is very encouraging for all of us, too. Yes, we have the message written down on paper. Also, there's the message that's going to be discerned by a spiritual sense, spiritual discernment, and it's there for all of us, and it's very encouraging. Thank you, Bruce. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Thank you. It is encouraging. I, I was thinking about her saying that the Bible was her textbook, and our textbook is Science and Health, and that is the only way that that the Bible has made sense to me is looking at it through Christian science with, with science and health. So I'm very grateful that she did all she did. Growing up, um, the church that I went to, you read the Bible as like a Bible story, that this was something that happened, but it really didn't have any meaning. It was okay, this happened, but it doesn't explain the spiritual meaning or how it applies to today. That's what I love about these Bible studies is um, you can read the Bible and read the, read the stories and do your lesson every day, every week, um, you know, with the, from the organization um, Bible um lesson sermons, but for years I did that, and I didn't really grow from reading those stories because there was no more further teaching, and here we really delve into them. We find out what was going on at the time and and what these things really mean and what was happening. It, It means so much. I think the point about the new tongue is so important. It's a new language we're learning through our spiritual sense. I just love it. 
And um, the thing that when I look at what she wrote here, it makes me think of why she wrote The New Birth, because we're on a different journey altogether. And however slow, it's a different one, you know, making the things of spirit becoming our reality instead of so delve, you know, dwelling in the mortal sense of things. So it is a new tongue that we are learning. Ready? I know I'm grateful for these Bible studies because very often something will happen in my day-to-day, and I'll think back to something we've covered in the Bible study, like, you know, who shall be the greatest. That one comes up a lot in life. <laughs> Another one. So I'm very, very grateful for all of these. And I never related it to today before the Bible studies. They've been such a big help. They really have. It's current. And you can see it happening again and again in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it, everything, everything that's happening in the world has a solution that can be found in the Bible. Like, time, times don't really change. Um, so that's what I find so incredibly beautiful about the Bible is how it can apply to absolutely today. And <clears throat> that's what I tell people because the Bible is being, um, it's being, you know, treated as if it's a fairy tale from long ago that has no, um, no application, you know, to life in the, sec- you know, the secular um, intellectuals, you know, want to pass it off as, as irrelevant. And they could not be more wrong. <laughs> well, um, should we get started? Take it away. Okay. Um, topic, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the Bible readings were from Matthew 26. Matthew 27, uh, John 21st, and Acts 2. The question number one, what is going on at this time with Jesus and the disciples? We're basically setting up what, what the time period is and what's happening at this, during this time. You're, you're usually the first one to answer yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it was, so, it's all a chance. So we'll give everybody else a chance. <laughs> well, it was coming... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It, it was coming up on the time of the Passover, Pass, Passover, Passover, the Passover feast, and it was a couple of days before, and Jesus told the disciples of his... You know, the, the crucifixion was going to happen right after the Passover. And um, I don't know if you want me to continue with what happened. Um, a woman, Mary, came and anointed his head with oil. And he said that this was for his burial. And then <clears throat> Judas, Judas betrays Jesus. And then they prepare for the Passover. And then... They sang a hymn and then continued to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus prays. He took all his disciples went out with him, but then he took his three disciples, Peter and the son, sons of Zebedee, James and John, and took them. He took them with him and asked them to pray with him, but he went a little further. And He came back, and the disciples had fallen asleep. And he did this three times, and they fell asleep each time. They did not stay awake and pray with him. And then he told them to take their rest. And then 
they came, they took Jesus. Jesus said that the scripture must be fulfilled. This was what was prophesied, what was predicted. And I'm kind of going through just highlighting that this is what happened in in, um, Matthew 26. And this is the end of his career, isn't it? Here. Yes. He, he starts by telling his disciples that what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. He knows that Judas is going to betray him. Uh, he knows that Peter's going to deny him. He asks for their prayerful support, and they don't give it to him. I think they're all pretty gloomy and dejected. I mean, there's this kangaroo court set up. Um, they already know what they want to do with Jesus, so it's, they have these trumped-up charges. And it's just, I, I think the, they, they felt kind of, the disciples felt like they couldn't do anything. And they were kind of gloomy. So much going on in this one chapter. I, I don't think I've ever read it through before. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, that happens to us today. Maybe we think there's so much to do, but we're not even doing what we're being asked to do, are we? I mean, you know, if they just if they had just watched, if they had just done the few things that they've been asked to do by the by Jesus. And that's where we all have to think, you know, are we doing at least the few things that we could do, can do? And this idea of watching, I cannot emphasize it enough. I mean, Mrs. Eddy said the future of of Christian science depends on watching. And we can change, we can change history. Won't be history, well, it'll change if we work the way we should. Because Mrs. Eddy has said, most of you have read this, by the year 2100, we will either have done this work or we will be plunged into the worst dark ages ever. Of course, that's in our unauthorized literature because, heaven forbid, people know about it. But it's very sobering. You know, as a child, I, I read several times, Gone with the Wind, and that was very sobering because... Scarlet's having this great big party, <laughs> and they're <laughs> expecting only happy times ahead of her. Civil War begins, and most of you know the story. It was it was gone with the wind. So we have an opportunity now to do what we should, and it's a solemn, important privilege to be working, an honor to be working. This work must be done. So please, are we going to say, could you not watch with me one hour? You know, after after Jesus said that, who did he look at? He looked at Peter. <laughs> Why do you think that? Well, Peter had claimed all men shall be offended because of the yet will I never be offended. Uh, Thank you. That's exactly why. Peter said he would. (laughs) So Jesus called him out. Now, no doubt, this was probably the hottest time ever, ever. And it's easy for me to sit here talking about it. I'd probably be snoring away. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But... And I just say that because I'm not being at all critical of these people. It's very hot. And and as, as Gary just said, Jesus knew all these things were going to happen. I mean, many, many people think, well, Judas had to have done what he did because if there wasn't a Judas, there wouldn't have been a resurrection. But, but if they had done, Mrs. Eddy yes. says, if the disciples had done what they should have done, 
it would have changed the course of history. I'd like to add to that hot time. I looked up crucifixion and the history for the Roman Empire and found out it had been done for a hundred years, both before and after Jesus, and that this was not just a punishment, but it was a form of really terrorism to terrorize the people who had to watch this um, in order to control the masses and control the minds of the people. And really it was a form of censorship because they said it's even possible that the thieves next to them might have just been people who were plotting um, against the government uh, at the time. I don't remember. I should have saved what I, where I read it from. It was a Bible commentary for another definition of thieves. But it was very clear in this history, which was not necessarily biased to religion, what this purpose was for this type of punishment. It was more than a punishment. And so, of course, it would be very terrifying for these people around Jesus. Thank you. And, you know, that, that is always the purpose of terrorism, is to terrify everybody, to submit them, to make them under your control. Go ahead. Paralyze them with fear so they can't do anything. Right. It was a horrendous death. And it was very humiliating. Plus, to add to that, one of the reasons it was so evil was that the belief at that time was that if you weren't buried, you couldn't go on to an afterlife, potentially. So that's why they, the whole thing with the cross, because it was to signify a complete end and you couldn't even go on to an afterlife. It was, what's really striking is that Jesus said, uh, he, after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So it was inevitable, I guess, because of the disciples and where they were at in their thought. And so it was inevitable. Yes. Yes. That was ever more reason why his uh, resurrection was so amazing and shocking to everybody because it proved that uh, that theory of uh, of uh, how you were treated after death was all a uh, myth. Also, yeah, they needed they needed proof that death is unreal. We 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 need it. <laughs> he he did this not only for them, but he did it for all of us. If their thought had been lifted to the point where they knew death was unreal, this would not have been necessary. And you know, Mrs. Eddie said that most of them didn't understand. <coughs> excuse me until until after the resurrection. They needed it. Yes, we all need it. We all need to keep it alive in our thought to know it's a possibility, and we are blocking the road to eternal life. We talked about last week. We we think of ascending, not of this sense of death and dying. No, the road of eternal life. We are all immortals. We have to act like it and expect it if we want it to ever happen. And really, throughout, he was showing with everything he did, he was proving spirit's reality, that it is spirit that's real. Obviously, they didn't understand. Yes. Yep. So you think of how we are at this point now, and if we really embrace, as Suzanne was saying, so grateful for the teachings of the Bible and knowing they are applicable right here and right now, and with having science and health for so long, we should be very advanced with our understanding. So we're at a new point, a new place. We have new challenges.
Let us not sleep. Well, the greatest pressure of even that punishment was worrying about how others were thinking towards you, really, um, also. So it's that pressure of the community or the pressure of people that is the thing to watch for. It always seems to be the way, but we have to be far beyond that. And you know, in many ways, I've often thought our our country maybe we don't have militia. Although actually, we are having a militia. We are at war. I mean, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. A different kind of war, but it's a war. And Mrs. Eddy says too about the mental warfare, and that is definitely going on. Gives plenty of employment. Yeah, thank you. Anything else on the background? Well, one thing I read too, and all the disciples, when Jesus asked, or told them that there was going to be someone who betrayed them, they didn't point fingers. They all said, "Lord, is it I?" Which I think is a good thing. I mean, they didn't say, oh, no, it's Carol, it's Lily. <laughs> it's Jeremy, but not me. <laughs> they said, is it I? Well, it means they thought not very well of each other, I guess. <laughs> well, that's true, too. <laughs> well, also, it, it shows a really good quality, doesn't it? Self-examination. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. the, hum the humility to question, am I on the right track here, or am I going off? Isn't that really an essential part of spiritual growth? It's a must, she said. Yeah. Well, there's an honesty to it, too, because if you haven't overcome that sense in yourself, then you're still susceptible to do it. good thing to examine. I think we've seen in this church where people will stand up and boastfully say, yeah, I'll never leave. I'll never quit this. I'll never go anywhere. How much healthier it might be. Pray to God, dear God, I humbly ask you to keep me in your path. Your servant. Instead, you. of, instead of opening your mouth and exposing yourself like that. Well, it seems a truism. Mrs. Evans used to talk about it. We had someone on a Wednesday night get up and say, I love this place. I will never leave it. And I don't know, two or three days he was gone. And I've had the similar experience. People have told me, I'm never, I love this place. I'm never leaving it. And, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so thou dost protest too much. Better to keep quiet and, and pray that God keep you on the straight and narrow. I know that he will, because he will. Why is that unwise to do? You invite the tempter. Well, yeah, yeah, you're tempting the devil. Because whenever, yeah, I mean, whenever you shout to the world, I'm something, the devil is going to say, okay, prove it. I'm a target. Yeah. You become, yeah. And you're target. waving a flag. And and if that's true, if it's really in your heart, you don't need to say it. It's true about so many things. If it's really true, you don't have to talk about it. Just do it. See it. Don't tell me. See it. Wait, Mrs. Are... Eddy? Uh, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say Mrs. Eddy herself prayed that Father show me my place and keep me in that place. So it just shows you know, the humility of it, not, you know, boasting that I can do this, I can do this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. She also talks about it. She said something to the effect of it's for future generations to, to judge some things like that. So better to let somebody else say about you, oh, he never left it, <laughs> 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 than for you to say it. And in precepts, Carpenter says sometimes it's better for someone 
who can't deal with it to get out of the get out of the limelight. Yeah, get out of the animal magnetism that would try to attack you if if you can't deal with it, then leave. At least leave for a while, come back, feel better prepared. She said this in a way to Judge Hannah and she's told Judge, what did she tell Judge Hannah? Take time to pray for yourself. Yeah, we have that beautiful prayer. I think that's the one called age was that was pray for yourself daily. Never fail to do it. And if you're getting so busy you don't have time to do that, then you better reconsider what you're doing in your life. I have something I'd like to add that I thought was really helpful in reference to Matthew 26, verse 23. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. I found some commentary on dipping his hand into the bowl with me. It was a custom still practiced by some in the Middle East to take a piece of bread or a piece of meat wrapped in bread and dip it into a bowl of sauce made of stewed fruit on the table. will betray me in that culture. As among Arabs today, to eat with a person was tantamount to say, I am your friend and will not hurt you. This fact made Jesus' deed all the more despicable. I mean, Judah's deed, excuse me, all the more despicable. Thank you, Ken. I didn't yeah. know that. Welcome. I found that really helpful. Uh-huh. Because he was, he was very... Du- Listen, and I'm, and I, as someone said before, Jesus knew all this. Gary, I guess he knew knew all this was going to happen. So, thank you very much. Well, that, that, that see that that that's really uh, interesting because you know all of Jesus' disciples claimed to be his friend. Even Judas claimed to be his friend. Judas actually thought he was doing the right thing. So, people who claim to be a friend don't always have the right concept of what true friendship really is. Do they? If it's a personal sense of friendship based on something other than God, you can't trust it. No, because people just change their minds. You know? <laughs> well, and if it's personal, comes up, something comes up, and they they're governed by something other than God. Yeah, they're quick to get offended, and they're quick to make mistakes. Who knows what they're going to do next? Yeah, Carpenter says, in precepts, here Jeremy found all these quotes I asked him to find. My my book was in another location. (laughs) Thank you, Jeremy. But Carpenter says, animal magnetism and mental suggestion are solely the human mind operating in ways that have for their intent to rob man of God. To those to whom the term animal magnetism, covering the action of the human mind, is distasteful, the third verse of the 22nd chapter of Luke should come as an awakening, proving that Jesus was handled by it, since he declares that Satan, since it declares that Satan entered him. When students realize, to some extent, they all yield to mesmerism, they realize how close many of them come at times to a betrayal of the master. Judas simply functioned under the human mind at a time when it required that dastardly deed to be done. Metaphysicians are not indignant at Judas for the betrayal, but at animal magnetism, although they do not mitigate Judas's responsibility for yielding to the human mind. 
And, you know, I read, too, think of it. Judas, Judas was one of the 12 disciples. He lived with the Christ. He saw all these wonderful healings. There's no mention that he was a bad person before this, this happened. And I thought it was very uh, touching to me. You know, I think it was Barbara and Pilar that wrote. He, he was to be pitied. And he did repent. But it was too late. So he fell. Pardon me? So he killed himself. So he killed himself. So he thought. Yeah. So he thought, yeah. But he, he did, at the end, repent and realize what he'd done, but they wouldn't listen. He even tried. He, he declared Jesus was innocent. He knew. He knew Jesus was innocent. So he just got badly handled, as this says, at a very bad time. One could see that easily, that uh, they might have uh, told him something like all they wanted to do was reprimand Jesus. And, uh, I mean, the Pharisees and such were all full of lies, so they could have told him anything. True. Some, You know, one of the commentators said they didn't really think Judas thought it was going to go to that degree, that he would... Tell him it was all a mistake, but it didn't work out that way at all. Yeah, I mean, and since we're on question number three, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's likely that Judas had no concept of the enormity of what was going on. That he thought, well, this was this would be a good way for us to to get a lot of money, and since Jesus is invincible. Uh, you know, he can't be hurt. And Judas's job within this group, he, he was the treasurer. And he had to think about the money that he carried. And he obviously did not understand that supply was infinite and spiritual. So he got handled by the human concept of money. It was, that, only, it was only after he saw what he could not imagine happening to Jesus that he realized he had been used. And then he hung himself. To that informed oh. statement later of um, the root of all evil is the love of money. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Gary, because I had no idea that he was the treasurer, and uh, it was something that, uh, I don't know, I guess it was a, a perception of something from God about when my sister and I were farming, there were many times when we were told we had to do this or that to make more money, and if we perceived it or thought that it was immoral, we stayed away from it, and uh, I've always been so grateful for that, because getting money for the wrong motive is that love of money that uh, was just mentioned. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And I read, I read that Judas had been stealing from the collective money bag, and because it was an unconfessed sin, it opened him to to the ploy of, of Satan. So this is why, and this is why keeping things in secret is so dangerous. That's the embryonic thought. You might do something you don't think is that bad. Mentioned in the lesson this week. Starts, the belief of sin, which has grown terrible in strength and influence, is an unconscious error in the beginning, an embryonic thought without motive. But afterwards, it governs the so-called man. So you watch those little suggestions. I mean, actually, stealing wasn't that little, but how does it first come? It first just slips in there, and then the next thing, you're controlled by it. 
So, and it was unrepented. How did you learn that he had been stealing? It was in a commentary. Oh, I see. You know, well, that's a big thought to me. I mean, that really puts him in a different light uh, and more understanding how this came about. Well, that's true. This commentary also said it, that it teaches even the best example, most compelling evidence, and the finest teaching cannot in and of itself change a human heart. In this case, I was talking about parents. You know, some, sometimes, well, you'll have a really good parent, and their child seems to go off. And so, I mean, Judas had certainly the best example in the world, and yet he went way off. It's always the workings of animal magnetism. And this is, again, why we watch, why we pray, why we look and see what's going on. We're not stupid. We stay ahead of the game um, as parents, as citizens of our country. See what Air is trying to do and then make sure it does not happen. And God tells you these things. And they never fail. They will always be proven to be right. While others sleep, you're seeing things that perhaps others are not. Well, that puts a whole incredibly different light on it uh, and really opens up things because, I mean, isn't that the way blackmail works? They find a person who has some little thing they owe money or they have some kind of a habit that's immoral or whatever, and then they blackmail them and get them to do their bidding and uh, downfall of others. Thank you. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I've heard that goes on in our government. They choose people that they can blackmail in order to patrol them. And if, if they succumb to it, then then we've got corrupt, corrupt government. So, you know, that's why it's so important to clear your slate. Maybe, I mean, who hasn't done something wrong or who hasn't? But if you repent of it and you've changed and you don't ever go back to it again, then let them say whatever they want to. They can't pull your chains. They couldn't pull Paul's chains. He, he was killing Christians, but he repented. So he still, I'm sure, felt bad about it, but it didn't change his course of doing good. It's very, very important you have that about yourself. Don't ever forget that. You must have a clear conscience. conscience. You can't have had all these affairs or done all these things, uh, stolen things or uh, all kinds of things that seem to go on these days, and then think you're going to proceed with your life as if, as if nothing happened. Not with the modern <laughs> news. They'll find it and they'll pin it up everywhere, and usually it's to your destruction. So repent, change, so you have this clear conscience and you can move forward. And that happens certainly don't have to be in government. It's been work, daily life. So, such a blessing to have a clear conscience. What does Mrs. Eddy say about conscience? Oh, nothing worse than a guilty yeah, conscience. Yeah, nothing worse than a guilty conscience. Nothing worse. <clears throat> so, keep your slate clear. There is nothing worse. Even that feeling, sometimes watching TV... This character will do something, and I'll get that feeling <laughs> from that, and I can't watch it anymore. <laughs> I hate that feeling. <laughs> Very true. Well. You know, there, you know, it's what's going to happen. And even if they can hide it, it'll blow up somewhere somehow. Anyway, I don't. Know. I don't. Do this. Shit. Should we, you want to talk about Peter? <laughs> yeah, should we, yeah, I was just going to say, question number two. After Jesus said to his disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, what happened with Peter? Well, before... The, what? No. The rest... All ye shall be offended because of this night. And then he goes on. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Now, 
What's he referring to? I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. He is going to be taken, and then the disciples will disperse with fear. Thank Thank you. you. He is referring to himself. And he is quoting, he's quoting Zechariah. Now, it's interesting because another commentary said, here he had the most eloquent speech of anyone probably, but he's quoting Zechariah, which kind of goes along, very much goes along, with what Tom is always teaching us, that the Old Testament relates directly to the New, and Jesus often quoted it. He did it in the Temptations and other things. He quoted it, and that's why we need to know it, too, so we can quote it, know who's who and what's what and what's going on, and, um, and not just think it's a bunch of old poppycock. So, okay, now go on to Peter. What's with Peter? Well, he instantly said that he would not be offended. Yeah, he claimed, not going to happen to me. And in doing that, he was also doing what? Putting everybody else down. Yes. He was arguing with the Christ. <laughs> Bad thing. Whoops. He thought he knew better than the Christ. It was very, very arrogant. It showed, as was Judas, Peter was not in the right mind or he couldn't have said it. It was... Uh, but animal courage, animal courage rather than moral courage. I'm going to do this, and no, I'll do, you know, I'm so great. Again, he put himself, what did you say, Carol? Target of him. Maggot, target, target of him. Yes. He was doing it for three years, too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he still had more to learn. Well, remember, they all... They all loved Jesus. They all thought that they were his friend. They all wanted to follow him. But it was a personal relationship, wasn't it? They hadn't gotten past the personal sense of things. They took the resurrection. Yes. You know, what really helped me is I found a commentary about offended. You will all forsake me and lose in a great measure your confidence in me. All of you will desert me. That really helped me. Thank you. It goes right along with the personal sense. Well, I mean, he, you know, he really did feel close to Jesus. He did love him. He did respect him. He followed Jesus to Caiaphas' house. He actually watched this trial going on. What did you call it, Susan? The kangaroo trial? (laughs) He actually watched it. However, he became fearful for his own life, didn't he? Because three times, Somebody came up to him and says, well, wait a minute, you're with him, aren't you? And he became fearful for his own life. What did Jesus say about those who love their life in this world? Lose it. Yeah, you're going to lose it. And, you know, where he sat, too, he sat, it said he sat far away off. You know, he was distant. Distant. <laughs> distant. <laughs> himself from the whole situation, which was not a good thing.
thing to do. And so he became, again, the sitting target to these women questioning him. Oh, yeah, I recognize you. And what, he started off lying, and the lying led to what? More lying. Yes, there's lying, and swearing, and then cursing. Why? He just dug, by himself. just dug himself in deeper in the hole that he, that he started to dig himself. He's doubling down. Yes. Error left alone grows worse. And he realized that before the cop crow, thou shalt deny me twice, and he went out and wept bitterly. That was one good thing about Peter. He, he was he, devastated. He was. He was truly repentant. Truly. Not just crocodile tears, not just crying for himself, but he realized what a terrible thing he'd done. I thought it was interesting that apparently he was the only disciple that even followed. Well, that's true. They all ran. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't say that anybody else went with him. You're right. That is he, he may have been the right. only one. Yep. So the sheep of the flock should be scattered abroad. Yep. So they they ran. They forsook him and ran. All of them. They hadn't professed being so great. But again, this was probably the hottest time in history. In Precepts 5, Carpenter quotes Mrs. Eddy having once said, quote, Never be too confident that you will not be made to do something against your will and wish. End quote. And then later Carpenter talks about Peter and says that um, Air attacked him where he considered his strongest point, not his weakest. And so he kind of was overconfident and dropped his watching there. I thought that was very helpful to remember. Thank you. Yeah, I read he was self-confident and he has self-conceit. And what he talked about was the self-quality that takes you out. Right. Yeah. I could be wrong, but I think the Bible says that John went in with Jesus. Peter stayed outside. And John went in. I'd have to check, but I think I saw that. Well, that wouldn't be surprising. That would be, make sense. Surprise me either. In the Carpenter book, Precept 2, Carpenter says that <clears throat> apparently the 11 disciples thought that Judas was a good man. I'm back to Judas. But he, he, he says, Carpenter, that John Didymore played the part of a present-day Judas when he betrayed his trust as a member of the board of directors and threw the church into a costly litigation. The question is, in regard to him, is was he fundamentally unsound or was his downfall the result of the malpractice of the workers around him that he could not handle? Did he have such confidence in his own Ability that when animal magnetism handled him, it caused him to be unconscious of this fact and to believe that everyone else around him was in error. The disciple Peter was a good man, yet he was handled by animal magnetism and did not know it. He was the very soul of honesty and was filled with moral courage for the truth. He did not see how he could be handled. So the master withdrew his protection. And then Peter made a mistake that even he could see, which proved to him his error. It was a beautiful and yet sad thing to see how the master handled the situation, so that Peter, as a result of that experience, became a far sounder and more effective Christian than he was before, or ever could have been. The reason <laughs> I had all these pages in the precepts marked, all these ones about Judas, because I, I prayed sincerely through all those difficult years that I would not be the Judas, that I would not betray in any way. 
Is it I? Or is it is it Peter? Is it I, Judas? Or is it I, Peter, who betrayed but then changed quickly on a dime, redeemed himself? Don't think that these things aren't happening now or couldn't happen. Because, go back to what Suzanne says, if they relate it all to you, that's the self-examination that's needed. And I've seen many of you who have gotten some difficult rebukes, and yet you haven't run. Haven't run. Haven't run. You stayed. You have worked it through. That is a sign of a good worker, more than anything else. Because it's very easy to run. It's very easy to get your feelings hurt or whatever, or just be lazy and not care. That's pretty bad too, especially when you consider all that is at stake. But thank God for those of you who stay, continue, work. Keep your shoulder to the plow. Thank God. And when necessary, are willing to weep bitterly. Well, I, I think as far as Peter goes, denying the Christ, I at least 10 years denying the Christ. <laughs> I have to think of that now. And I'm not, not happy about it, but it happened. So. And that, that is so encouraging because we, we can know people who are denying the Christ seem so set in their denial of the Christ. And yet, good Jeremy turned around entirely always must expect that. It will happen. Sooner or later, it will happen. It can't help but happen. It's the truth. You can't, you can't avoid the truth. I'm very grateful for this uh, Bible study lesson today because uh, it made me realize that there's good news and bad news for me. The good news <laughs> is that I realize that I, the bad news is that I've been offending the Christ daily. And uh, it may not be to the degree of having him crucified, because that already happened, but uh, every time I don't follow exactly in his footsteps, I mean, I've had enough lessons from not only the Bible, but also Mary Baker Eddy, where I have no excuses, and yet I seem to be able to do it. Well, isn't that wonderful? You can see it. Mike, that's an honest admission. It's a safe place to be. And that's why well, I'd argue. I'd argue that point. <laughs> well, no, I mean you're right. It doesn't feel good to actually recognize that, but the fact that you can recognize it and admit it is an excellent characteristic. That's much better than glossing it over and denying it. Yeah. You're doing what you need, what needs to be done, so that's good. Yeah, you're, it's infinitely better. Because I've, I've done that, glossing it over and denying it, and you're, you just continue in the problem. It gets worse, not good. Better admit it, better say, I could have done better, yes. We can all do better. Mrs. Eddie says that we can all do better. So even if you feel you're getting a rebuke or accused falsely in some way, hey, I can do better. I'll take it. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You can't ever go wrong. When you recognize you can always do better. And this <laughs> Beautiful lesson, and this was Florence, Florence, quite thorough, dealing with everything. Okay, we have two more questions. Yes, I was number four. Um, how did Jesus deal with Peter at the Sea of Tiberias?
Hey, Lil, how did he deal? Peter was sort of grieved at the end when three times it was said to him. Because he, had, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. And he knew. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fairly. He had denied him three times. So Jesus now was telling him three times what he was to do to feed the sheep. And it's just very touching because Peter was very grieved by this. I uh, saying, you know I love you. And Jesus thrilled him. And he emphasized it. He emphasized it to Peter. And Jesus undoubtedly knew that he would follow, and he would do. He would be the sheep. I think in a way, too, it was Jesus showing him that, you know, I forgive you, and you can go on, and you can do the things that I taught you. Yes. And Jesus kept saying that to him because he knew that he was a good person. A Christly person. Yeah. The only one is good God. Jesus knew Peter's potential. He knew what he could do. So he nailed him to the wall. to make sure that Peter would never, ever again fail his mission that God had for him to do. It was like a positive echo of the three denial. Yeah. And remember this, he spoke this at the very end. So it's one of the most important things that Christ wanted to be done was his sheep being fed. And, you know, take it, take it too very seriously. When you ever, if you were ever, you know, reading or um, doing the fruitage or doing these Bible questions or whatever you're doing for our church, I, I, I always think of feed my sheep. Father, how, how would you have me feed your sheep? If you open up your thought to that, God will answer, and you will be led, you'll be moved by him. Whatever it is, whatever task, feed my sheep. It was preparing Peter for what was to happen, to go where he did such tremendous work, when the Christ was no longer, not the Christ, but Jesus no longer there. I think this is a good example, too, of what you mentioned, Mary, when people say, oh, I will never leave church and this is the place for me. He didn't leave Jesus, even though he felt he did a terrible thing. He stayed the course and then came out better for it. Like what Mike was talking about, you know, I guess maybe I've done this wrong, but not condemning ourselves, which is something I've had to learn, and just to keep going on, use force. And, and it's perfect because that's how we demonstrate the truth, Christ. Thank you. That's absolutely. And that's the true repentance, not the just talking one. Condemnation, I don't believe ever to be right. I'm not sure. I don't, can't think of any time it's been the right thing to do different from repentance. You're just condemning yourself. You're like damning yourself. That's never right. That's not science. And you know, we've talked about this before, but it's such a beautiful thing. And this is only in chapter Mark when they when they entered Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, 
When they were entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples, and... And who? And Peter. And Peter. Thank you. To cause you to weep. Why did Why did he say tell you tell his disciples and Peter? Peter probably thought that he messed up too much. That's right. <laughs> to come back. So. Well, he knew what was in Peter's thought. He read thought. He knew that Peter felt so badly that he would might he might not be welcome. Because he was a disciple, it said, tell his disciples and Peter. Well, Peter was a disciple. And then that he goeth before you into Galilee, meaning Jesus. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. He wanted to make sure, this angel, that Peter knew he was included such tremendous love. This is, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. This is the love we should feel from our Father, Mother God, from the Christ. No matter what you've done, no matter how you've gone off, I mean, can you imagine denying Jesus like he did after saying he would never do it, sleeping at Gethsemane? But even then, the shepherd thought, goes searching, 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 looking, looking, assessing everything, knowing who's where and what's what, and not letting anyone perish. How? how? The mind of Christ can't be done humanly. It's only by, through the Christ that you know things. Through the Christ you know things and see things that others don't seem to know or see. So, it's a beautiful story. It should end all condemnation. It should. But his heart, Peter's heart, was right. And then we go to the last question. How did this, go ahead, Betty. Oh, um, the last question. How did this experience change Peter? He was on fire. Yes. He's the one who stood up at Pentecost and uh, was very convincing and declaring the Christ and calling all to him. And like 3,000 people were baptized at that time. Yes, he was able to preach a sermon that baptized that many people, 3,000. He was on fire, and that fire was felt, attracted those who needed this truth, went on to do great healing work. In uh, 1 Peter 5, 8, he writes also, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And I, thought, I just really appreciated his writings and Peter more after this Bible study. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. He knew. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Lauren. No, I, I was just saying he's lived it. So he was warning others in that quote that um, Linda gave just now. Yes. And, you know, sometimes when you go through fiery trials, you're, you're better able to help others. And, mm-hmm your destiny, your divine destiny. I love how this experience, it grew him a backbone. And when that happens, your whole world changes when you stand up for what's right. True. Whole world changes. You, you couldn't believe, you know, the way you once were and the way you are now. And it usually, <laughs> yeah. it usually takes someone who loves enough to shake you up 
down until you finally get it. At least get it somewhat. Yeah. And he was no longer afraid for his own life. Yeah. He didn't, seem, he didn't act like a teacher's pet anymore. <laughs> well, that's true. That's a very good description of him. I can say or do anything because Jesus likes me so much. <laughs> I remember years ago here at Plainfield, um, I had been attending for several years, but I got a rebuke, and basically it was a few questions like, where are you? Sometimes you appear and then you disappear. You're just not consistent. And it was just like, wow, somebody just called me out on the carpet? But that was such a gift. And then I started to be more consistent. And it didn't happen overnight, but I was just so grateful. Sometimes I think about that. And I'm like, what if that person had not called me out? I'd still be kind of in the shadows. I think he even used those words. You're in the shadows. You're lurking around. And then once in a while, you show your face. And I was like, okay, I've just been called out. <laughs> And once, once you were, and once you made that change in a more of a commitment, you, you changed incredibly. You were like a different person. Yep. And that's what repent means, doesn't it? It means to change. Yeah, get it real. Get it real. And, you know, everyone's asked different. Everyone is different with everyone. So some who do more and should, and there are others who maybe not yet, but everyone should be making some progress in the right direction every day. And there's something that everyone can do. Everyone can do something. And there's also one thing that we can all do, which is what? Watch. Watch, work, and pray. I'll do that. And love. And love. Work, 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 watch and pray. <laughs> Never any excuse not to do those things. I wanted to remind everybody the time changes tonight. You move your clock back. Back an hour. Ooh, fall back. Fall back, yes. And if you don't, You'll be early for church tomorrow. <laughs> and that'll All by yourself. <laughs> That's right. So when you wake up in the morning, believe what your cell phone tells you. <laughs> yeah. And only your cell phone. Right. And you'll be wondering, yeah. <laughs> also, I don't believe we have a volunteer for next week. Oh, that's right. And if we don't... Uh, we Tom don't. said he would do it if um, we didn't have a volunteer. Does anyone want to volunteer? Sure, we have a. Okay. I volunteered like a week, a week yeah, ago. Yeah, you did. You said if uh, no one else volunteered, so I was waiting to see. But we'll put your name on. Oh, well, let's not wait till late. So just throw no. me up there. Your name's on. Thank you. Done. Thank you. thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Betty. Thank, thank you, Betty. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Betty. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Betty.